next speaker is Paul Oncardia, who is uh, an engineer at Google working on App Engine. Um, and in his 20% time, he plays with regular expressions. Hi everyone, my name is Paul Wonkadir, I'm a systems engineer at Google, and this is the story of RedGrep, from regular expression derivatives to LLVM. I started working on RedGrep as a 20% project in mid-2011. My colleague Jamie Wilkinson had pointed me to a paper on regular expression derivatives earlier in the year, but my real motivation didn't come until a couple of months after that, when we were seeing PCRE causing stack overflows in production, because somebody mistyped a regular expression. The, the regular expression in question was attempting to use negative look-ahead to negate the match. That is to say, match strings that do not look like this. And I remembered that regular expression derivatives allow you to do this really easily. So I sat down that weekend and hacked together the first prototype of RedRep in Python. It's been a long and interesting journey since then, and there's still a long way to go, because uh, as it turns out, capturing groups are really kind of complicated. Whereas merely matching a regular expression is, um, well, it's a lot like drawing an owl, actually. So if you don't know how to draw an owl, it's pretty simple. You draw some circles, and then you fill in the details. <laughs> uh, RedGrep works in a similar way. You draw some circles, and then you fill in the details. <laughs> now, terrible jokes aside, there on the left is the DFA that matches dot, any character in UTF-8. It matches the leading byte, and then the correct number of continuation bytes. And there on the right, is x8664 machine code that implements that DFA. Now, funnily enough, all of this is really just putting together ideas from over four decades ago. Janice Berzhazovsky wrote a paper on regular expression derivatives in 1964. Ken Thompson wrote a paper on compiling regular expression derivatives to IBM 7094 machine code in 1968. Okay, so before I go on to talk about what regular expression derivatives are, I should just clarify what regular expressions are. My apologies to the mathematicians in the room. I won't be talking about semi-rings or clean algebras or any of that other abstract stuff. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just gonna say that regular expressions specify sets of strings. So then given a regular expression R specifying a set of strings S, the derivative of R with respect to a character C specifies the strings in S that begin with C and then you chop off the C. Now hopefully an example will make this a little bit clearer. Take the regular expression ABC or DEF. This specifies the set containing the strings ABC and DEF. The derivative with respect to A specifies the set containing the string BC. The derivative with respect to D specifies the set containing the string EF. And the derivative with respect to G specifies the empty set. Now the empty set is a set that contains no strings. If you end up with this, it's like being in, a state of the, it's like being in the error state of the DFA. You can't match anything. On the other hand, the empty string is a string that contains no characters. If you end up with this in a set, it's like being in an accepting state of the DFA. If you stop there, you know the input string is matched. So we say that a set that contains the empty string is nullable, and therefore a, a regular expression that matches the empty string is also nullable. So regular expressions specify sets of strings by using set expressions to build up from fundamental sets that contain individual characters. Disjunction, x or y, corresponds to set union. Concatenation, x, y, corresponds to Cartesian product. And in the literature, it's typically denoted with a dot, as for multiplication. Clean closure, x star, zero or more x, corresponds to empty set, union x, union, union x, x, union x, 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 and so on to infinity. Conjunction, x and y, corresponds to set intersection. And complement, not x, corresponds to set complement. Now you probably won't have seen those last two used in regular expressions before. Now the funny thing is that they are possible to implement with more conventional techniques. They're just really annoying. For example, complement is implemented by constructing the DFA and then inverting the acceptingness of each state. From there you can implement conjunction by using De Morgan's laws by translating x and y to not of, not x or not y, which is annoying. Whereas using regular expression derivatives, implementing conjunction is actually no more difficult than implementing disjunction, and we'll see how later. So okay, so what can we do with this? We can, for a start, we can simulate assertions like you might have seen in Perl before. Indeed, RedRep actually implements negated character classes as a form of negative look-ahead assertion. For example, negated character class ABC becomes not character class ABC and dot. The way this works is that not character class ABC 
specifies the set containing all the strings that are not the individual characters A, B, and C. This is an infinitely large set. But and dot restricts that to the strings that are individual characters. The reason that I did this in RedGrep is so that only the parser needs to worry about negated character classes. Everything else can just deal with normal character classes, which makes things a lot simpler. So apart from that, we can do crazy cool things like specify strings that contain foo and contain bar in any order and do not contain quacks and do not contain one, two, three. And I'll show you the DFA for this a little bit later. So putting this all together, how do we match an input string? That fairly simple algorithm is just simply saying that we compute the running derivative for each character in the input string. So we start off with a set of strings, we go along slicing each character of the input string off until we have a final set of strings. Then if that final set of strings contains the empty string, that is the regular expression that it corresponds to is nullable, then we know that the input string matched. Otherwise, it didn't match. This is equivalent to computing a path through the DFA on the fly. Now, given that you usually match more than one input string against a regular expression, it makes sense typically to construct the DFA first. Okay, so how do we do that? Slightly more complicated algorithm, but all that's saying is that you compute all possible derivatives. Now, that sounds like brute force. That's because it is. But <laughs> there, are, there is a way, there's a trick to slowing, uh, to, to speeding that up, sorry. <laughs> there's a trick to speeding that up that I will show you a little bit later. But for now, let's just consider an alternative. If we were following a textbook, we might pass the regular expression, construct the NFA, construct the DFA from that, and then minimize the DFA. Regular expression derivatives allow you to pass the regular expression and then construct the DFA directly from that. And if we take some measures to identify equivalent regular expressions, that is, regular expressions that specify the same set of strings, then we can eliminate duplicate states and uh, construct the minimal DFA, or at least a very close to minimal DFA. Okay, so in lieu of another terrible Lowell joke, let's just uh, check out some code. So the first thing I want to show you is the implementation of any character, or dot, as we saw before. Now you can see here that I have some byte ranges declared for the leading bytes and a continuation byte. Then we string those together in one, two, three, and four byte range sequences and join them together with a disjunction. The reason that I've done this is because it's easier to match on a byte oriented, in a byte-oriented way than to decode UTF-8, or it's faster. Similarly, character specifying individual character works by encoding the character to UTF-8. Um, what do you mean reverse video? White background. White, white background. <laughs> Sweet. Where was I? <laughs> <laughs> um, Character, uh, implementing a single character, you encode the character to UTF-8, producing a one, two, three, or four byte sequence, and then you match that sequence. Again, this is faster than trying to decode UTF-8, typically, especially if you're doing it inside a loop. Okay, so the way that I implemented in RedGrep the a way of detecting uh, equivalent regular expressions is by normalizing the regular expressions before we do anything with them. The way that uh, this works is that it just rewrites, transforms, simplifies, if you will, regular expressions. So for instance, clean closure, r star star becomes r star, empty set star becomes empty string, empty string star also becomes empty string, slash c star becomes the complement of the empty set. Now, the empty set is a set that contains no strings, so the complement of the empty set is a set that contains all strings. What's going on here? Well, slash c means any byte, any single byte. So zero or more of any byte is pretty much any string. So that makes sense. Dot star also becomes the complement of the empty set. Now this is not strictly correct, given that we saw just before that dot is like byte ranges in sequences. So it's not the same as any byte. But the reason that I did this is because I assert that what people mean when they say dot star is match anything. You may feel free to disagree with me. Concatenation. Okay, so the way this works is what we're mostly doing is skewing the tree. Actually, it's more of a graph in red grep, but anyway, the tree off to the right so that we have a concatenation with a head and a tail, and the tail may be also a concatenation with a head and a tail, and so on. 
The reason for this is so that when we compute the derivative, we can just chop off the head and return the tail immediately, which typically saves time and memory. Apart from that, if we find an empty set anywhere in the concatenation, the whole thing collapses to empty set, and if we find empty string anywhere in the concatenation, we leave it out. Complement is really simple. Complement of complement cancels out, so not not r becomes r. Is nullable? So as I said before, if a regular expression is nullable, it can match the empty string. So empty string obviously matches the empty string. Clean closure can also match the empty string because it matches zero or more times. For concatenation, we check if the head is nullable and then if the tail is nullable. For complement, we check if the sub-expression is nullable and then invert the result. Conjunction and disjunction check their sub-expressions using short-circuiting logic. Derivative. Okay, so empty set and empty string. You can't chop anything off, so you always return empty set. For any bytes, you can chop anything off, so you always return empty string. For byte and byte range, if the byte matches or is in the range, you can chop it off, so therefore you return empty string, otherwise you return empty set. For clean closure, the way this works is that we unroll it once and then go from there. Now, what happens if it matched zero times and we want to potentially try moving past it in a concatenation? Well, that's handled in concatenation. So if the head is nullable, and clean closures are nullable, then we can do two things. We can derive the head, and plug on the tail, or we can derive the tail. So we do both and join them together with a disjunction. Otherwise, if the head is not nullable, we just compute the derivative of the head and plug on the tail. The, uh, for complement, the derivative of a complement is the complement of the derivative of the sub-expression. And for conjunction and disjunction, we, can compute, the <laughs> we compute the derivative of the sub-expressions and then join them together with the, the parent kind. Okay, partitions. Now, this is the trick that I mentioned before for speeding up DFA construction. Uh, very simply, all it is is partitioning the character space into sets of characters that reduce the same derivative. The best example I can give of this would be dot. So you can, you can chop off any character, so you compute one derivative using any character, rather than computing 256 of the same derivative. Another example would be A. Therefore, the partitions are A and bytes that are not A. So you compute one derivative with respect to A, another derivative with respect to some byte that's not A, and that saves you 254 more computations. So we're now in a position to have a look at our first match function, which works directly on a regular expression. This corresponds to the first algorithm that I showed you, which computes a derivative on the fly. And this is exactly what the code's doing. It can, for each byte in the input string, it computes a derivative and normalizes it then the input string matched if the final regular expression is nullable. Compile corresponds to, it compiles a regular expression to a derivative, uh, sorry, to a DFA. It corresponds to the second algorithm that I showed you before, and is in fact is very, very close to that, adding only the partition computation. So we have a list, uh, a queue of regular expressions. We push the initial regular expression onto that queue. Then while the queue is not empty, we pop a regular expression off the front. We normalize it. We get a state number for it. We record whether it's accepting, depending on whether it's nullable. Then we compute the partitions. Then for each, uh, each partition, we take take one byte from that partition, compute a derivative, normalize it, get a state number for it. If we haven't seen it before, then we add it to the queue. And then, other, and then we fall through and for each tr uh, byte in the partition, we record a transition from the current state to the next state for that byte. So then we come now to the second match function, which uses the DFA for matching. This is a fairly straightforward state machine. So while for each byte in the input string, we look up a transition from the current state to the next state, we move from the current state to the next state. And then finally, the input string matched if that final state is accepting. Okay, LLVM. LLVM is um, awesome, but kind of scary at first and maybe a little bit after. Um, but it, no, seriously, it has, actually, it has actually improved over the years. They've added things like Type Builder and IR Builder, which really improve things for people trying to use the API. So code that used to be or would have been mostly unreadable can now actually be mostly readable. So before I go on to talk about generating the function in the intermediate representation, I just want to call out a couple of, uh, of the transform passes or the optimizations. The first one is the promote memory to register pass. This simply asks LLVM to try to keep variables in registers rather than loading from memory and then storing back to memory after each operation. Pardon me. The second one is a loop deletion pass, which is a really lovely optimization. So say we get into a state that corresponds to the empty string or corresponds to the complement of, sorry, complement corresponds to the empty set or the complement of the empty set. 
this meaning match nothing or match everything, respectively. Now, without this optimization, we would enter that state and then spin for the rest of the input string before returning the same result. There is nothing that we could do that would change the result of the function. So LLVM actually detects this and allows us to return immediately true or false, depending, oh, false or true, respectively. Uh, this is a really lovely optimization, and I'm so glad that I didn't have to implement the logic by hand. Okay, so generating the function. The first thing we do is create a function object, then we create an entry basic block. Now, a basic block is a sequence of instructions with exactly one entry point and one exit point, and then you wire those all together. So we create an entry basic block. Then we create two variables, data and size, or if you would prefer, pointer and length, and then we store the function arguments in those variables. Then we create a basic block that returns true and a basic block that returns false. Then for each DFA state, we create two basic blocks. The first one checks if we've hit the end of the string. If we have, it branches to return true or return false, depending on whether the state was accepting. Otherwise, it branches to the second basic block, which updates the uh, va variables, you know, increment the pointer, decrement the length, and then enters a switch. And by this, I literally mean a C-style switch, which determines a transition to the next state. From there, we, for each transition, we look up the basic block corresponding to the current state, the basic block corresponding to the next state, and then enter, update the switch to enter a transition from the current state to the next state for that input byte. After that, we plug in the basic block to the first, uh, the entry basic block to the first basic block of state zero, run the transform passes, and we're done. So then to generate, actually generate the machine code, we ask LLVM for the address of the machine code, which implies that it has to generate it. I just skipped over a bit of code which simply gets the size of the machine code, which is useful for when we want to disassemble it. But just to call it, all we need is the address. So then now we come to our final match function, which uses that, and it's exactly two lines long. The first one casts from the void pointer to the function pointer of the correct type, and then calls into it, passing data and size, and returns the Boolean result. Voila. <laughs> and seriously, that's it. That's all of the code. So, um, live demos. Okay, so I promised that I'd show you dot star foo dot star 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 star one two three dot star. So this is just simple boring dot output. <laughs> Don't laugh, it's only 29 states. Okay, so we have a 29 state. It is, it's only 29 states. 29 state DFA. Okay, so the main thing that's going on here is we have four clusters, if you will, of states. What's, got, what's happening is that in the first cluster at the top, it's looking for foo or bar. And depending on which one it finds, it'll move to one of those middle two clusters. So if it found foo, it'll go here and, and look for bar. If it found bar, it'll go here and look for foo. If it finds what it was looking for there, it'll proceed to the final cluster, which is all, consists of accepting states. Now, the key thing is that in, at all times, in all clusters, it's also looking for quarks and one, two, three. And if it finds either of those, it drops out to the error state, and then LLVM will allow you to return immediately. What else? A regular expression to match an IPv4 address, or dotted quad if you prefer. Um, if you're asked this in an interview, what would be the worst possible answer you could give that would still be technically correct? Would it look something like this? <laughs> First octet, second octet, <laughs> third octet, fourth octet. Uh, 25 state DFA, four clusters corresponding to the four octets, and of course the reason that I showed you this is to demonstrate the power of the minimization that regular expression derivatives give you. Not for free, but in passing. You don't need a second stage of minimization. Okay, let's have a look at some assembly language. So we saw dot before, I'll actually walk through this pretty quickly. Check if, the, uh, check if the length is zero. If it is zero, then we return false. Otherwise, grab the first byte. Check if it's a valid leading byte. If it's not, returns false. Decrement the length, increment the pointer. Move the address of a jump table into RCX and jump through it using that first byte as an offset. So we'll have four destinations for this jump depending on what kind of leading byte we had. The very next instruction there will be the destination if we have now three leading bytes. Therefore, we had a four byte sequence. And it flows through, and the destinations for two, one, and zero leading bytes, oh, sorry, continuation bytes, follow on smoothly. 
So we check if the length is zero. If it is, we return false. Otherwise, we check if we have a valid continuation byte. If we don't, return false. Decrement the length, increment the pointer. So that's one leading byte, two leading bytes, three leading bytes. Then finally, we check that the length is zero. If it is, return true. Otherwise, return false. Slash C, again, slash C means any match any byte. Check if the length is zero. If it is, return false. Otherwise, decrement the length. Check if it's zero. If it is zero, return true. Otherwise, return false. Now, this is terrible code. <laughs> um, seriously, all, all it should be doing is checking that the length is one and returning true or false, depending on that. It actually becomes even more silly when you try to match three, and it goes decrement check, decrement check, decrement check. Now, this is not anybody's fault in particular. I simply haven't told LLVM to do any more aggressive optimizations. The reason for that is, the reason for that is that I'd be afraid I couldn't explain the machine code if I did. <laughs> Okay, let's see who's been paying attention. What should slash C star assemble to? Anyone? Thank you. <laughs> it does. Dot star also returns true. Okay, matching A. Check if the length is zero. If it is, return false. Compare the byte to A. If it's not equal to A, return false. Decrement the length. If it's now zero, return true. Otherwise, return false. Pretty, silly. Pretty simple. A star, check if the length of zero, if it is return true, because we're matching zero or more. Otherwise, decrement the length, compare the byte to A, load the address of the next byte, and then if the byte was A, jump back to the beginning. Now, the reason that we use the LEAQ instruction is because it doesn't change the CPU flags. So the conditional branch will be using the result of the compare. If we had an increment instead of the LEAQ instruction, that would mess up the CPU flags, and so the, the conditional branch wouldn't work. Anyway, so if we didn't take that branch, then the byte was not equal to A, so we just returned false. A plus, actually I won't go through that, it's just A and A star smashed together. Z a question marks, zero one A's. Check if the length is zero, if it is, we return true. Otherwise, compare the byte to A, if it's not equal to A, return false. Decrement the length, if it's zero, return true. Otherwise, return false. dot star a dot star, so does the string contain a? Check if the length is zero, if it is return false, otherwise decrement the length, compare the byte to a, load the address of the next byte, and if the byte wasn't a, jump back to the beginning. If we didn't jump back to the beginning, then the byte was a, so we just return true straight away. Now, this code doesn't look too bad. Um, I mean, it's 29 bytes, it'll easily fit in a cache line, so what's wrong with it? Well, the answer is, if you're looking for a byte in memory, you just use memchar from libc, because modern implementations will be vectorized, so it reads in a glob of memory at once, uses vector operations to compare all of them at once, and then reduces the result. This is way, way faster than doing it a byte at a time. So, we'll, and we'll actually see, uh, get an idea of how much faster in the benchmarks. So, I ran these benchmarks on my workstation at work. It's an Intel Westmere 2.2 gigahertz, blah, blah, blah. The input strings are from 32 to 32 million random one-byte runes. And I say random one-byte runes because the benchmarks look for two-byte runes. And therefore, I'm guaranteeing that the leading byte will not be found, even though these are random, it will not be found in the one-byte runes because the one-byte runes are constrained to effectively the low ASCII space. I am racing red grep against RE2, which is Google's regular expression engine, because it's Google's regular expression engine. Um, well, actually, no, because it's, it's also automata-based. It's, uh, it, it's byte-oriented, similar to the way the red grep is, and it's also pretty fast. So, uh, first thing I should point out is the y-axis is in megabytes a second. And you can see that RE2 completely blows away red grep. Um, in fact, I think it was so fast that the timings were unstable. But we're all pretty sure, we're pretty sure that we're smashing up against memory bandwidth limits there. Um, so, uh, whereas, uh, RE2 is obviously using memchar, whereas red grep is doing its byte at a time thing. And it's limping along at a mere 1.1, 1.2 gigabytes a second. So, how can we... So how, can, so how can we make RE2 not use memchar so we can measure how fast RE2 is? Well, we simply can use a character class with two two-byte runes sufficiently far apart that their leading bytes are different, and then, RE, and then, uh, then you can't use memchar to search for two things at the same time. So that's what I've done here. Now RE2 drops down to 250 megabytes a second, and red grep drops down to 800 megabytes a second. Now, the reason that, this is, that it's slowed down is because it's doing two compares on each pass through the loop, comparing for the first leading byte and then for the second leading byte, and then resuming, then restarting the loop. This is, uh, 
This is another case where, again, we depend on LLVM to do the optimization. And in this particular case, we want it to optimize the switch for us. Now, as we saw before, DOT will typically generate a jump table. If we have a continuous range, it'll use a range check. If we have a, range, a small enough range, that's, but it's not continuous, it'll do a range check and then a bit mask. If we have two compares, it'll, uh, sorry, if we have two cases, it'll do two compares. One case, I mean, apart from the default case, one case will have one compare, as we've already seen. So it really does depend, again, on the optimizations and the, uh, the optimization settings and transform passes that, uh, that RedGrep wants to use. Pardon me. So, finally, live, uh, final live demo. Let me just set this up and then talk over the top of it. Okay, so everybody would be familiar, I guess, with the uh, practice of piping greps together. Grep foo, pipe to grep to bar, maybe grep v to leave some stuff out. Just check that's in cache. Okay, cool. So I have here about a one gigabyte text file, 15 million lines, and they look kind of like that. So I basically got a gigabyte of random words from user shared dict words and smashed them into lines with FMT. So let's have a race. Um, I guess I should point out, if anybody's not aware, fgrep does not mean, the f does not mean fast. Um, in fact, I think you'll agree when you see the time that f does not mean fast. It actually means fixed string, and in theory that should be faster than trying to match, regular, match them as regular expressions. Do I have enough time to have a drink of water? No? Oh, okay. 500, okay, 5, 3, 4, 6 lines in 22 seconds. That's not particularly nice. Let's try Perl. Print if foo and bar. Five, three, four, six lines in five seconds. Okay, red grep. Five, three, four, six lines in two seconds. So that's not too bad. Let's make this a little bit more interesting. There's a bunch of uh, apostrophe S's in that, just in that top section there alone, and plenty more throughout the rest of the file. So let's leave those out. And just for even more fun, let's leave out every line containing the character I. <laughs> um, now, I would have preferred to use the, uh, keep going with the FUBAR quarks123 example, but it turns out that quarks and 123 aren't really in the English dictionary. <laughs> um, <coughs> same principles apply though, I promise. <laughs> that is some serious horse ebook stuff right there. <laughs> okay, so 22 seconds again. Print if foo and bar and not uh, s and not i. Same three lines in five seconds. And not. Same three lines in one second. It actually sped up. What's up with that? So if we think back to the three bar clocks one, two, three DFA, I said that in every cluster of states, it's always looking for those things that you don't want to be there. And that's exactly what's going on here. It's looking for apostrophe S and I all the time. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, okay, sure, but you could, re depending on, you know, looking at your data set, maybe you should rearrange the greps or rearrange the conditions in your Perl. And that's, it may, you, that may get you a speed up. And of course, depending on whether your data set has any inherent structure to it, it would be, in fact, probably a really smart thing to do. But the simple fact is that you are doing one to four passes over each line for grep and for, uh, and for Perl, whereas red grep is guaranteeing you exactly one pass over each line, or at most one pass over each line, it, because it may drop out on the first character if it's uh, an I, I or an apostrophe somehow. Um, now, the funny thing is that Perl can actually do something similar to red grep using positive and negative look ahead, except that it's about twice as slow as just using separate, separate conditions, or it was when I tried, so I'm not sure what's up with that. Anyway, so, uh, just to not jinx myself, I shall quit while I'm ahead. <laughs> so, red rep. Um, the project site is on Google Code. There's a mailing list on Google Groups, which has um, commit messages and nothing else because I don't have any users, but that's okay. 
that's okay. I'm actually cool with that because this, this talk was not about promoting red grep. This talk was about promoting the idea that regular expressions can be really powerful, but they are not black magic. Okay, not everybody will need to write a regular expression uh, engine, and I understand that. But some of you may want to after having seen this talk. That would be awesome. So if you do, remember, it doesn't have to be difficult, it doesn't have to be slow, and it definitely doesn't have to crash. Easy, fast, and safe. Pick any three. It is possible. You saw it here today. <laughs> Thank you. Just curious, but um, what does dot star not...